I think I'm going to start. Um, so this is really the beginning of the finance part of the course. So far, we've reviewed general equilibrium, which I said Fisher invented or reinvented in order to do finance. And as you remember, the, 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 the main conclusions from general equilibrium are first that uh, the market functioning by itself without interference uh, from the outside, in other words, a situation of laissez-faire leads to allocations that are Pareto efficient. So they're in some sense good for the economy and good for the society. They don't maximize total welfare. That's not even a well-defined thing as we saw last time because how can you measure, how can you add one person's utility to another? It doesn't even make sense. So economists at first were wrong to think of that as the criterion for good allocations. But there's another better definition of efficiency that Pareto invented called Pareto efficiency and the free market achieves Pareto efficiency, at least if there are no externalities and there's no monopoly. So that lesson number one was taken to mean that the government shouldn't, shouldn't interfere in the free market, especially shouldn't interfere in financial markets and that's something we're going to come to examine. The second lesson we found was that the price is determined by marginal utility. So if you, it's not determined by total utility. So uh, it may be that water is much more valuable than diamonds because it does a lot more good for everybody and for the world as a whole than diamonds do. But the last drop of water, really most people have as much water as they need, the last drop of water is not doing that much, whereas the last diamond is a rare thing and not many people have them. So the last drop of water is worth less than the last equal weight of diamonds and therefore water is much cheaper than diamonds even though water is much more valuable as a whole than diamonds. The price of things de depend on their marginal utility. Uh, so you, you, uh, you, a third implication of what we did is that there's no such thing as a just price. It depends on what people's utilities are and how much they like it. It depends on how much of the good there is. That's why diamonds are, are priced less than water. And it depends on who, how wealthy people are. If you transfer money from people who don't like apples compared to tomatoes to people who like apples a lot compared to tomatoes, the price in the free market is going to reflect more the latter class of people than the former because they've got the money to spend and so the price of apples is going to go up relative to the price of tomatoes. So those are the three basic lessons of general equilibrium which we, sh the first one about laissez-faire has a huge implication for what we, whether there should be regulation but the second pair of implications, uh, you know, what determines the price and how price changes as you redistribute wealth and so on and no just price, that set of ideas you'll see is also going to be very important for finance. So those lessons seem clear. Some of those lessons were understood already by Aristotle as we said. So the ancients understood supply and demand, at least a little bit of supply and demand. And yet as soon as they moved from apples and oranges to finance, they all got hopelessly confused. So Aristotle said, interest is unnatural. I, I could go through a lot of people and what they said, but I'm going I'm to just leave it at a few, a few quotations. The Bible says interest is terrible. Judaism um, frowns on interest. Christianity frowns on is interest. Islam frowns on interest. All the great religions of the world, crystallizing, obviously some of the most important thinking of the time, frowns on interest. So just to remind you of a few, um, so what, 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 why do they frown on interest? Well, the idea is that you, know, you do nothing, the lender does nothing, and he gets back more than he lent to begin with. He's making a profit without having exerted any effort whatsoever. So someone named Middleton said, in trade, both parties are expected to gain, whereas in lending at usury, only the usurer could profit. So, um, you know, in Deuteronomy, in the Bible, so this is the Jewish Bible, it says, Thou shalt not lend on usury, that just means interest, thou shalt not lend on usury to thy brother. Usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. That's all terrible. Of course, unto a foreigner thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto a brother thou shalt not lend upon usury. Okay, so the Jews could lend to Christians, but not to each other. So the Christian church outlawed usury, called it a mortal sin. 
Luther, for example, says, for whoso lends that he wants it back better or more, that is open and damnable ochre. Those who do that are all daylight robbers, thieves, and ochres. Those are little Jewish arts and tricks. So um, there was this antipathy towards usury, and because Jewish moneylenders were able to lend to Christians, there was a, an antipathy to Jewish moneylenders, which we're going to come to when we talk about Shakespeare. So Muslims also forbid uh, lending. In fact, even today, it's illegal to charge interest in Islamic law. So in my hedge fund, we tried to raise money. Uh, I mean, there's lots of money in the Middle East. So we try, and, and most of it, by the way, 10 years ago, was invented. Almost all Middle Eastern money was invested in U.S. government bonds and U.S. stocks. Nothing else, like in mortgages, for instance. So we, I went to uh, Saudi Arabia, and I meant a bunch of brothers of the king, you know, uh, the eldest brothers of the kings, and I suggested they invest in our hedge fund. And they actually became sort of interested, and so we had to write up a complicated contract. Now, you know, a mortgage pays interest, so if you invest in the hedge, in the hedge fund and the mortgage is paying interest, it looks like they're getting interest, and so that wasn't going to do. So we had to write a very elaborate contract which disguised the fact that interest was being paid, and it had to be overseen and uh, blessed according to Sharia law by a holy person who was going to verify that there was no interest. Now he charged a fee which was a percent a year which looked an awful lot like interest. But anyway, so, <laughs> so the point is all these religions have banished interest despite the fact that they themselves were involved in interest and lending and borrowing and so all the, you know, you just, the, a world can't function really without uh, lending and borrowing and the charging of interest. But, so I don't mean to, so, so these religions that forbade it at the same time knew that it was going on and uh, allowed it to go on and sometimes participated in it. But the point I'm trying to make is that there was vast confusion, and even today there's confusion because still today the, the you know, Jewish law doesn't allow for interest between Jews, and there's a charade that goes on there just like there is in, in Islamic law and just like there is uh, still frowned upon by the Christian church. So... Um, it's a hard subject to understand. And why is that? Why is it that it's so confusing and how should we understand it? Well, Fisher cut through all this extremely simply and the way he did it was to, he said, let's just think mathematically. Then we won't get so tied up in all these religious complexities. Just let's do something mathematical and concrete. So suppose that we consider a problem, which is the one I'm going to work with the rest of the class, maybe it better be do it over here. So let's say that there are two agents um, uh, and two goods. So the two goods now are X1 and X2. So Fisher's first insight is that let's think of X1 and X2 as apples. But apples today and apples next year, Fisher said, although they're both apples exactly alike, there's no difference between these apples, the apples this year are different goods from the apples next year. So let's move away from apples and tomatoes to apples this year and apples next year. So I'm not going to call them goods X and Y anymore. I'm going to subscript them by time. So X, these are both X because it's the same good, but they're, they're different goods because they occur at different time periods. So Fisher said we can incorporate time uh, simply by having different goods. So of course people, he said, are going to have some utility uh, of consuming today versus consuming tomorrow. And let's say this utility is log x1 plus one half log x2. Okay, for Mr. A. So I'm going to come back to this uh, in half an hour and, and point and explain why Fisher thought that this half made sense. You see, this agent A thinks a lot more, likes good one a lot more than good two. So Fisher would say that's because Agent A is impatient. An apple is an apple. But if you get it now, it's worth more to you. It gives you higher utility than getting an apple next year. This is a law of human nature, he claimed, which I'm going to come back to later. And, it, and uh, that's why people, uh, when you write down the utility function, there's a discount factor, which we're going to add, a discount factor, which discounts, reduces the utility you get from future consumption. So let's say UB of X1 and x2 is equal to uh, log x1 plus log x2. So b 
is more patient than A is. B actually doesn't discount the future. A does discount the future. So A is impatient, relatively impatient, and B is patient. OK, so then let's make it, they have endowment. So EA, this, let's say the endowment is 1, 0. And um, say it's 1, 1. And, and EB, let's make that. Uh, one zero. Okay, but now Fisher wants to talk about finance, and he wants to talk about stocks and bonds and interest and all kinds of things. So he says, okay, you know, we've talked about goods with no problem. We can talk about goods today and next year with no problem. Let's talk about stocks. What is a stock? Let's say there are two stocks. Okay, stock alpha and stock beta. So Fisher says, I mean, what, what are stocks? I mean, they're pieces of paper that you're trading, but they give you ownership of something, like a factory or a company or something. And what's good, what good is the company? Well, the good of the company is that it's going to produce something. So let's say that the stock is going to produce something in the future. So we'll call the production of the stock. So what is, what is the future? It's just X. There's only one, there are only apples in the future. So let's say D alpha 2 is 1 and d beta 2 equals 2. Okay, so Fisher says, uh, you know, you can tell a lot of stories about what this stock does and what, you know, how, what its method of production is and, you know, what kind of managers it has and a lot of stuff like that. But in the end, people care about the stock because the stock is going to produce something. And the value of the stock is going to come from what it produces. So, D alpha 2 is what people expect the output of the stock to be next year, which is the last year we're worrying about. And D beta 2, which is 2, is what people expect the stock to produce next year. And we're going to assume that uh, perfect foresight here. So Fisher says, well, you know, in general, people's expectations might be wrong. But let's start off with the case when you know, people anticipate something. Surely they're looking ahead to the future when deciding whether to buy the stock. We've got to assume something about what they think. Let's suppose they actually get it right and they know what the price of the stock is next period. Okay, so what's going to, uh, what's going to happen? Um, well, we can define an economy and presumably the interest rate and the stock prices and all that are going to come out. Now, I should mention, by the way, I forgot to say this, uh, but as I write this down, I suddenly realize I forgot to mention it. You know, there are other theories of interest, too. Another famous one was Marx's theory of interest. So uh, this is to be contrasted with Fisher. Marx, what did Marx uh, say? So in my youth, when I was your age, it was very fashionable to be a Marxist. Um, so every, all of, you know, you could almost, anyway, you had to study Marxism, basically. If you wanted to talk to women, you had to know about Marx. So anyhow, <laughs> so I dutifully went off and read Marx. And so what's the idea of Marx? The idea was that uh, he imagined uh, uh, an ag uh, agricultural economy where you plant stuff today and then the output comes out tomorrow. So you put corn in, the, in, in today, corn comes out tomorrow. So it doesn't require much effort to plant the corn. It requires a lot of effort. You have to buy the corn. So the capitalist would, would buy the corn, but planting it didn't require much effort. However, harvesting it, you know, picking the cotton, you know, picking the chocolate, um, you know, picking all that stuff takes a lot of effort. So in the end, you'd get a lot of output. Now, when you pick the output, you'd have to pay workers in order to, to, to pick the output. So Marx imagined that there was a wage that was arrived at by the struggle between uh, struggle, class struggle, between the capitalists and the workers over the subsistence wage. So um, the subsistence wage was something that resulted, subsistence wage resulted from this huge class struggle and um, you know, over time, maybe it would rise as, as workers got stronger, but it was still always quite low. And the subsistence wage was what the workers would get. And what's left over, which was the surplus, okay, what was, so the output being more than what was put in was the surplus. Part of the surplus would go to the subsistence wage. The rest would go to profit. And so if you look at how much was put in to begin with, 
you get all the output back out, the same amount of corn you put in, plus some extra you have to give it to the workers, and extra you give to uh, the, that the capitalist gets back at his, at his profit. The fact that the capitalist has done no work at all, he just bought the corn, let someone else plant it, let someone else harvest it, paid all those guys virtually nothing at the beginning, and a lot at the end, he's gotten profit for doing nothing, just like when you lend money. And so this profit, so the profit divided by the initial outlay, that's, that was the rate of interest. And so uh, Marx said that a capitalist, he could put his money in his bank or he could run this farm and make profit this way. So the money interest in the bank would have to turn out to be the same as this rate of profit. Otherwise, he'd put all the money in the bank and if it was smaller, he wouldn't, you know, the banks would have to give higher interest in order to attract depositors. So the capitalist profit rate of interest was determined by the rate of profit and the rate of profit was determined by the struggle between capital and labor. Okay, so we've got these religious figures and great philosophers saying interest is terrible. We've got this great philosopher economist saying it's the result of a st class struggle. And now we've got Fisher, actually Marx was pretty mathematical, but now we've got Fisher turning it into a simple math problem and saying, let's reason out the math problem and we'll have the answer to these questions and it'll turn out to be quite different from what all these guys are saying. So, his, so here's his economy that I just uh, described, the Fisher example not literally an example he gave, but similar to one he gave. So he said, all right, what happens in this economy? Let's just be very commonsensical. What we need to find out now is, is financial equilibrium. So financial equilibrium is much more complicated seeming than we had before because we care about the prices. So now I'm going to use Q for prices. So these are going to be IQ for contemporary prices. Q contemporary, so the price you pay today to get the apple today. Q2 is the price you pay next year to get the apple next year. They're contemporary prices. Okay, and then, but we, we've got a more, and of course people are going to decide what they want to do, XA1, what they're going to end up consuming, XA2, XB1, XB2, but now we've got a more complicated world. There are stocks to be traded. So, and there's the price of stocks. So P pi alpha, I'm running out of letters, so I'm going to switch to a Greek one. This is the price of stock A, stock alpha. And pi beta is the price of stock beta. Okay? And then we have to know what, what are people going to, how many shares are they going to hold? Well, it's going to be theta. Uh, a is going to hold a certain number of shares alpha and theta. A is going to hold a certain number of shares of stock beta and B is going to hold a certain number of shares of alpha and a certain number of shares of beta. So we want to solve for all of that. Now, I should have said at the beginning, if these are trees producing apples, there was an initial stock of, of uh, people owned a certain number of trees. So let's say theta alpha A, so this is the original ownership, original ownership of alpha. Okay, let's just say that, I'll make up some number, I might as well use the same number I thought of before. Let's say that's one, and let's say theta B alpha is zero, and let's say theta bar A of beta is a half, and theta bar B of beta is a half. Okay, so what we've begun, so this is, so the original economy is more complicated than before because we've added stocks, we characterized the stock, we said, okay, a stock is a very complicated thing, a company's very complicated, depends on managers and processes and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you think about when you think about a stock, but really at heart, all people are trying to do is forecast what are they going to produce. And so we're going to make it simple mathematically and say, let's say we know what they're going to produce next period. And then people begin, so let's say it's a tree. Everybody knows the alpha tree is producing one apple, the beta tree is producing two, two apples. Alpha happens to own the only alpha tree. And beta, and A and B, A owns the alpha tree, excuse me. And A and B own half each of the beta tree. Okay, so that's the original economy, and the equilibrium is going to be 
How are they going to, what are the prices going to turn out to be of X1 and X2? What are the prices of the trades going to turn out to be? How much will people consume and how many shares? I mean, because Alpha A began with all of the tree, maybe he'll sell his shares of tree and end up with not having a tree in the end. So we have to see where they began, the stock ownership to begin with, and where they end up. So that's what we have to solve all of that. It looks way more complicated than before and so complicated that you can see why people might have gotten confused. But according to Fisher, it's going to turn out to be a very simple problem in the end once we look at it the right way. So are there any questions about what the economy is and what are the variables that we're trying to explain? Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't remember what that says over um, beta alpha A. It's original ownership. Original ownership of stock alpha. And this is original ownership by B of stock alpha. This is original ownership by A of stock beta. And this is the original ownership by B of stock beta. Original ownership of alpha. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. D is the dividend. That's the output that we can all. Okay, thank you. I should just write this down. This is the anticipated dividend, which is the output, since there's an, that's the end of the world, of stock alpha in period two. And D beta of 2 is the anticipated dividend of stock beta in period 2. So it's one apple we're getting out of the alpha tree, two apples out of the beta tree. And we're at, right, that's what the tree is good for. We could look at how beautiful it is. We could, we could talk about how much the owner is actually watering the tree. We can talk about a lot of complicated stuff. But in the end, all we care about is how many apples we expect to get out of it. All the other stuff goes into helping us think about how many apples we're going to get out of it in the end. So we cut to the bottom line, what are the apples we expect to get out of the tree? One from the apple tree, two from the beta tree. There was a, someone else had their hand up. Okay, any other questions about the setup? Okay, so we're returning to first principles here. Very simple example, you know, the, uh, when there's ever a big confusion about something important, it's always good to go to first principles. There was a chess player when I was young named Mikel Tal, who was a world champion for a little while, and he said that every two or three years he'd go back and read his original, you know, introductory textbooks on chess. Um, so we're going back to the first principles. How would you define equilibrium here for a financial equilibrium? Well, the first thing, you know, is just common sense. What are people doing? At time one, they're going to, what can they do? They can spend money. So let's say, so I'm going to look at the budget set for agent I. You know, and I can be A or B. So I don't have to write it twice. Okay, so he's going to say to himself, let's say A is he and B is she. He's going to say, uh, I, okay, A, I is he. He's going to say to himself, uh, let's say I can, um, I will say, how much does it cost me to buy goods? Well, the cost of apples is Q1 times X1. That's how many apples I might end up with. Now, how much does it cost me to buy shares? It's going to be pi alpha times how many shares I end up with, theta alpha plus pi beta times theta beta. Okay? So I'm buying goods. I'm buying alpha shares. And I'm buying beta shares. And this is how much I have to spend to get the holdings I want of each. Now, where did I get the money to do that? I got the money to do that because I started with my endowment, you know, of goods, which was EI1, which in this case for A was one unit, for B was also one unit, and then I also had shares to begin with of these stocks. So I had theta bar alpha plus pi beta theta bar beta. That's, that's in period one, that's what I had to do. I wanted to buy apples, shares, and I had shares to sell and apples to sell. So that's, uh, that's what I did. So, of course, if X1 is bigger than the number of apples I started with, that means I has bought apples because he ends up with more than he started with. So on net, he must have been buying apples. If theta alpha 
is more than theta bar alpha. It means that alpha bought shares of stock alpha. If theta alpha is less than theta bar alpha. It means alpha sold shares of stock alpha. All right. Now, in the second period, what happens? Well, in the second period, we have Q2 times X2. Now, nobody, the shares are going to be worthless in period two. So no one's going to buy them. Why are the shares worthless? Remember that when you buy a share of stock, you, the dividend comes later. You don't get the dividend immediately. So someone buying stock in period two, it's too late to get the dividend. It's already gone to the owner who bought the sh shares in period one. So the, the buyer of a stock gets the dividend you know, for a month or something. So next period's dividend is still going to go to the buyer uh, in period one. That's why it's valuable to buy shares in period one because you get next year's apple. Okay, so by next period, you can buy the tree, but the world's coming to an end. The tree's not going to do you any good. It doesn't produce any more apples. So nobody's going to bother buying shares. I don't have to bother with them. The prices are zero. Okay, and so what income do people have in period two? Well, they've got the contemporaneous price times, you know, the apples that somehow they find on the ground that they're, you know, or that their parents are going to leave them when they get old. So that's their endowment of apples. But what else do they have? They've got more apples than that. What else do they have? The dividends, okay? And so what are the dividends? Well, you bought theta alpha to begin with. So that's D alpha 2. So if you bought you know, the whole tree, then you've got all the dividends. And similarly with beta. Theta beta times D, out D beta 2. Okay, so that's it. So the budget set is a little more complicated. It's, uh, uh, so that's the budget set, okay? So it's got two equalities instead of one equality. So already things look a little more complicated. Now, so an equilibrium is going to have to be that uh, I chooses x i1, x i2, theta uh, alpha, you know, I could write it theta i alpha, theta i beta. That's all the choices he has uh, to maximize u i subject to this budget set. Okay, so A is going to pick, you know, what shares to hold, how much to do, consume today, and then, of course, looking forward, A is going to be able to figure out what he's going to end up consuming tomorrow. All right, so, and now in equilibrium, we have to have that XA1 plus XB1 has to equal EA1 plus EA, EB1, okay, and XA2, and then, and then we do the shares, theta, a alpha plus theta B alpha has to equal theta bar A alpha plus theta bar B alpha, right? The, the stock market has to clear and theta A beta plus theta B beta has to equal theta bar A beta plus theta bar B beta. Okay, so in period one, the demand for apples has to equal the supply of all the agents. Okay, but now what's the last equation? This is a little trickier. What's the last equation? XA2 plus XB2 equals EA2 plus EB2. Is that it? No, there's something else. So they're the, the apples are, right, the total consumption of apples is going to be the apples that they, you know, have on the ground, but also the ones that were picked off the trees. So these dividends. So it's going to be the total dividends, which are theta bar A alpha plus theta bar B alpha times that tree, D alpha 2 plus theta bar A beta plus theta bar B beta times D beta. Okay, so, so just to say it in words, it's exactly we, what we had before, except we have to take into account, in addition to the goods market clearing, we have to take into account that the stock market has to clear, 
and in the end, demand for goods has to equal the supply that people had in their endowments, but also what the companies are producing. These companies are producing output, you know, apples, and so that's part of what the consumption is going to be in the economy. Okay, are you with me here? It's a good time for questions, maybe. Yes. Okay, so in period two, you might wonder, pi alpha is the price of the stock at period one, stock alpha in period one, pi beta is the price of the stock beta in period one. How come I didn't write down the price of the stocks in period two and keep track of what they're holding in period two? And the reason is that when you buy a stock, you're buying it not for the dividends at the same moment in time. You don't get those dividends. The guy who already had it gets those dividends. When you buy the stock, you're buying it for the future dividends you can get. And I've assumed the world's going to end after two periods because nobody's utility you know, cares about period three. So if you buy the stock in period two, it's too late for you to get anything. There are no dividends because period, you could only get them in period three and there won't be any dividends in period three and if there were you wouldn't care about them anyway. So the stock's worthless to you. So the price of the stock in period two of both stocks is going to be zero. So there's no point in putting down what people are buying of the stocks or selling or anything. It's just not worth anything. But in general, you're right and we're going to be more complicated uh, later when you look at your income from having bought the stocks, you'll have as your income the dividend from the stocks plus the resale value of the stock because you could sell the stock next period. But I just know that resale value is going to be zero because you're in the last period of the economy. Okay, and I just want to keep it very simple this first time. So, you, so it's, you could, yeah. So we'll see, you know, step by step, you'll be able to keep very complicated things in your head, but not right at first. So any other questions? Yes. You mean, why do people um, have endowments today and next year? Because you could think of the endowment, for example, as here we've got apples, but usually the endowment is your labor. So you can work this year. What if your most important endowment is your energy and your labor. So you've got it this year. Next year, if you're still alive, you're going to, that's new labor that you have. It's a different good, so it's a second endowment that you have. So, you know, I don't want to get caught up in labor and all that and get, involved with Marx again. So I'm just going to talk about apples. You have an endowment of apples when you're young and next year somehow you're going to have more apples. So you could think of the, you, you might have thought that the only apples next year come from what the firms are producing. But, you know, I've allowed for the possibility that people have apples too, just like their labor next year. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Well, this is EA, this is EA, so I should have written this more carefully maybe, EA1 and EA2 is that, and this is EB1 and EB2 is that. So, as he was suggesting back there, I've assumed for person B that, you know, he's got an apple now, somehow the world, you know, we, we aren't modeling what happened to get us here. The guy's got an apple today. They both have an apple today. Somehow A is also going to have another apple tomorrow that, uh, you know, he's going to find under his doorstep somehow that isn't being produced by the tree. And maybe you think of it as labor that he's going to have next period. All right. So... That's it. Fisher says, as soon as you write down the economy mathematically, all sorts of things are going to occur to you, which if you're talking in words about justice and injustice, you know you're going to be lost. So what, what, what can we get right away out of this? Uh, what can we get right away out of this? Well, the first thing is, how would we define inflation? What is inflation? What's inflation in this economy? Assuming we've got the equilibrium, which we're going to get soon, we're going to calculate it, but right now we don't know what the numbers, you know we've got a bunch of equations and stuff. We don't know what XA1 and Q1 and Q2 are going to turn out to be, but we're going to find out very soon. But before we find out, assuming we've gotten those, what will inflation be? What is inflation?
Yeah. Is it how much um, the ratio of price of the dividend has changed? Well, we're talking about inflation. When you talk about the consumer price index, inflation, what are they talking about? Yep. It's the rise of Q1 and Q2. Okay, so inflation is just Q2 over Q1. Right, so that's the price of apples today. It's the price of apples next year. If the price of apples next year is bigger than this year, we've got inflation. If it's lower, we've got deflation. Okay, so already the model, you know, you're talking about inflation. Okay, what, what else? Uh, what's the next most obvious? Uh, okay, well, I think I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff and get now to the key idea. Key idea is arbitrage. Okay, so Fisher says people have, you know, they have foresight. They're anticipating what the dividends are going to be. They, 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 they can, you know, they understand that, you know, you can talk about how beautiful the tree is and how much you like the owners and how much they're watering it and all kinds of, whether they have a good plan for irrigation and, you know, whether they did well in college and stuff like that. But in the end, all you care about the trees is what, how many apples they're going to produce. So knowing that, can we say something about pi alpha versus pi beta? In equilibrium, what's going to have to happen? There's going to be some connection. And what's the connection going to be? You've got two trees. Well, yeah. Right. So pi alpha is going to be pi beta times d. Um, uh, let's see. Pi alpha. Okay. So. It, Alpha will be better as long as the hopefully I haven't got I got that in the right uh, order. If and so in this case, pi alpha is going to equal a half pi beta because alpha is producing half the dividend that beta is producing. So obviously, it's going to turn out to have half the price. That. That's the fundamental principle. Okay, we're doing it in the most trivial case, but it's the most fundamental principle of finance, that if you've got two assets and one of them, they're basically the same up to scale, then their prices have to be the same up to scale. Who's going to bother to buy alpha if it costs, three time, if it costs you know, the same amount as beta when it only produces half as much? Okay, yes. Well, it is something like that, but that's a word that we haven't defined yet, so we're going to define it in the next class. So it's something like that, yep. Any other? Okay, so that is a very simple thing. Now, suppose I added, suppose I added, okay, so here's, here's a, uh, suppose I added, suppose after finding the equilibrium, I added a third asset, asset that paid uh, one dollar in period two next year. Okay, now, it would have a price, I've added a third asset, gamma, then what, so pi gamma, we'd have to solve for the equilibrium, pi gamma, and is there some word that I could use? How could I, so gamma is an asset that pays a dollar in period two. It's like a bond promising a dollar in period two. The price of the bond would then have to be what? One over one plus i, where I is called the nominal interest rate. So, so we've got inflation is occurring in the model. If I added a bond, which I didn't bother to do because it's just yet another thing I'd have to write down, I could have had a third asset, which pays a dollar. So the others are paying off in, in apples. This one's paying a dollar, and its price today you know, if you pay 80 cents today, it's like saying, I'm paying 80 cents today, I'm getting a whole dollar tomorrow, so it's like a 25% rate of interest, okay? Because another way of saying it is that I put in pi, you know, so one over pi gamma is one plus i. I put only pi gamma in today, I get one out tomorrow, so I've gotten back not only the pi gamma I put in, but something extra, that's one plus the interest rate. 
Okay, so the, the, this world is going to have an interest rate in it. It's going to have inflation in it. With me so far? All right, so now Fisher makes his most important... Okay, so let me add one more thing. I could come back to this. So I said that... I said that... Um, I said that if you take theta alpha less than theta bar alpha, it means you're selling the stock. So I'm going to allow people to go even further, theta alpha less than zero. Okay, so let me just write that again. Theta alpha less than theta bar alpha means, means uh, selling alpha. Theta alpha less than zero is doing a lot more than selling you. You don't have it to begin with. So how can you, what are you selling? Well, the mathematics is telling you that over here, theta alpha is going to be negative. You've got, you're, instead of getting extra dividends, you're going to be giving up dividends because it's going to reduce your supply of money. So theta alpha less than zero is called selling short. Ugh. which one I've lost, but that'll be bad. Okay, so you're, you're, uh, if you can still hear me, you're selling short, this means. Okay, so you're selling something you don't even, you don't even have. It's also called naked selling. It's also called making a promise. Without collateral. Okay, so I'm going to, for now, allow for that. So we're not taking into account that anybody's defaulting. If you take theta alpha negative, it means your income in the future is going to be reduced because you're going to have to deliver the dividend, because you're going to have negative dividends, which means effectively you take out of your endowment those dividends and hand them over. So it's, so it's as if you always keep your promises. So this model, so far, the official model, assumes no default, no collateral. We're not worrying about any of that stuff. Okay, and of course, that's going to be a critical thing. So you see, something's happened that we never happened, had happened before in the past. You traded money for a football ticket. You gave up something you wanted. You got something uh, that you also wanted. It was a trade of value for value. Everybody agreed the two things you traded were equally valuable. If you take theta alpha negative, by taking theta alpha negative, okay, that becomes a negative number here. So it allows you to spend more. You can buy more goods by taking theta alpha negative. That's negative. That means this can be more positive and still satisfy this constraint. So by selling a stock short, you're, you're promising to do something in the future. You get more money now. You can eat more now. And then, of course, you have to consume less in the future because you have to pay back your promise. So you're exchanging something valuable. You're, you know, you're getting money, something valuable, in exchange for a promise, which is worth nothing until the future when you deliver on your promise. When you buy the stock, you know, you're buying part of the tree, but the tree's doing nothing for you now. You're doing it because it's going to be valuable next period. You're actually not physically owning the tree, you're owning a piece of paper that gives you a right to half the dividends of the tree. So you're getting something that's only good because it's a promise you think is being kept. Okay, so, so far we're going, for the next few lectures, we're going to ignore the fact that people get very nervous when they give something up that's valuable in exchange for something that's just a promise. But, okay, so a critical thing has happened here. So we've kept the same mathematics except we've surreptitiously added this huge assumption. Now Fisher said, having done that, what can you realize? This is the most important insight. He said, this model, it looks so complicated. It looks like now we have vastly more equations. No wonder Marx and all those religious zealots were getting confused. You know, uh, <laughs> we can simplify it all and be back to where we were before and yet talk about finance. So Fisher introduced the idea of present value prices. Okay, so he said, look, when you buy a stock, what are you really doing? 
This is the principle of arbitrage. He says, when you buy a stock, you're saying to yourself, I'm giving up money today. Now, money today is consumption, because I would have used that money if I didn't buy stocks. I would have bought apples today and eaten them. So when I buy a stock, I'm giving up apples today. I'm getting the stock, which is then paying me dividends tomorrow, which whatever they are, I'm selling off, you know, I'm, I'm getting a profit out of the stock tomorrow, and then I'm ending up with apples tomorrow. Maybe I'm just eating the dividends straight off the tree. So when I buy a stock, I'm really giving up apples today and getting apples tomorrow. And no matter how I do it, whether it's through stock alpha or through stock beta or through a nominal bond, it's got to be the case that all three ways, or all 50 other ways you could imagine doing it, have to give me the same trade-off. This is your yield you were talking about, the same trade-off. The amount of apples I effectively give up today in order to get apples tomorrow is going to be the same no matter which way I do it. If it weren't the same, if, if alpha's price was more than a half of betas, nobody would buy alpha. In fact, they would start selling alpha. Okay, so that's why this assumption is so important. What would they do? Not only would nobody buy alpha, but they start selling it. They'd say, well, alpha is so expensive. Uh, you know, let's say it's the same price as beta. I can sell alpha. With every alpha I sell, I can buy stock beta. And so I haven't done anything today, but in the future, I've got stock beta, which is paying me two. I owe because I sold stock alpha short. I owe one, so I'll pay off the one I owe, and I'll still be left with one. I'm making an arbitrage profit. And so I'm not going to stop at selling one share of alpha. I'll sell two shares of alpha, then three shares of alpha, then a million shares of alpha. And everybody will be selling uh, alpha short to buy beta, and, and uh, you know, the market for alpha will never clear. So that's why the prices will have to adjust. And so it can't be, it has to be in equilibrium. The price of alpha is exactly the height, half the price of beta, which is to say, in short, that if you solve for this equilibrium, you can solve for an equilibrium where um, P1 equals Q1 is the price today of an apple today, and P2 is the price today, or it's called present value price, price today of an apple next year. Okay, so if you've got this equilibrium by, by working your way through, you know, by figuring out what the price of alpha is, uh, so the stock, for example, you want to figure out what the, what the stock is. Suppose the stock of alpha, suppose the price turns out to be uh, a half. Okay, then by paying a half today, you can buy stock alpha, which is going to pay you a whole dividend. Okay, so the price, therefore, of an entire, oh, let's do beta. Suppose the price of beta is a, is a is a, is a quarter. Okay, suppose we happen to find out that the price of beta is a quarter. Then what's P2? How much do you have to give up today in order to get an apple? Well, by paying a quarter today, that's the price, by paying a quarter today, you're getting two dividends. So by paying a quarter today, you're getting two dividends. If you paid to get one dividend, you'd have to pay an eighth today. So the price um, P2 would be an eighth in that case. Okay, so by, by looking, piercing through the veil of the stock market, you can always figure out what you're effectively paying today in order to get an apple next period. And that price, which we just computed, would be the same whether we looked at it from the point of view of going through stock beta or through stock alpha or through the nominal bond. It would always have to give us the same answer. So we know from the financial equilibrium, we can deduce what P1 and P2 have to be, the present value prices. And so effectively, Furthermore, uh, stocks effectively just add to the endowments of goods. Okay, so um, we can now consider another economy. So let's consider the economy E hat, so the economy, the hat economy. So u hat of x1 and x2, a, is the same as it was before, u a of x1, x2. u hat b of x1 and x2 is the same as it was before. But 
endowments now, e hat a1, e hat a2, is going to be what? Well, a over here began with one unit of each good. But a also owned all of stock alpha and half of stock theta. So all of stock alpha pays one dividend in the future. So really, A effectively has claim on two apples in the future and another half of beta, which is another apple in the future. So really, A's initial endowment of goods is 1, 3. OK, how did I get that again? I said it was one apple to begin with he could anticipate having. He knew he owned all of stock alpha, okay, which pays one apple. So that's another one that's really his. And then in the future, he's going to get half of the of the dividends of stock beta, and half of two is also one. So he's got three apples in the future. And beta, B, I'm sorry, he had B2. Well, his one doesn't change today, but how many, what's his claim effectively on dividends in the future? <laughs> one. Thank you. Somebody answered that. Um, so, We've now reduced the financial equilibrium to a general equilibrium. The same kind of economy we had before. It's just that we had to augment the endowments to take into account that pe people own stuff through the stocks. Okay? So what's the equilibrium of this economy? This equilibrium has a, this has a simple general equilibrium. Okay, so what is it? How do we solve for equilibrium? Well, take P1 equal to 1. And we'll solve for P2. So let's just clear the first market. How do you clear it? You're with me here? It's a standard general equilibrium, the same kind we've done many times before. So let's see if I can do it. So person one is going to spend a third of his money. And how much money does he have? He has P1 times, so he has 1 plus P2 times 3. That's A, right? His endowment is 1, 3. This is his income. And he's spending a third of it on good 1. And the price of good 1, P1, okay, here is just 1. And then B is going to spend, he's a half-half Cobb Douglas guy. So this is 1, and this is 1. He's spending half of his money, and his income is 1 plus P2 times 1 divided by 1. Okay, and that has to equal the total endowment, which is 2. 1 plus 1. So did I go too fast? I, yes. Well, it's probably wrong. So let's see if I, let's try it again. Maybe it's 2 thirds. Okay, so let's try, uh, let's see what I was doing. I'm saying, here are the, I've taken the financial economy, which is very complicated, looks very hard to solve, and Fisher says, you know, of course, when we add uncertainty and things like that, we're going to have to do other tricks. But without uncertainty, with perfect foresight and so on, and no uncertainty, Fisher says this is an easy problem to solve. You take the financial equilibrium with all its extra variables, and you realize if people are rational, they're going to see through all that complicated stuff. They're going to realize that alpha is just half as good as beta. And so they're going to realize that by holding stock, they're making a certain trade-off between alpha and beta. And we calculated the trade-off. P2 was going to equal P2. <laughs> P2 was going to be <laughs> what was P2? I forgot what P2 was. Anyway, the the how much did you have to pay? Okay, if you pay pi alpha divided by d alpha two, something like that, was P2 because by um, Okay, so if, if it costs you a certain amount of money and you get, you know, if it costs you a quarter, we said, and you get, uh, this was beta, so this is P2. So through either stock, like beta is the one I solved it for, I said suppose beta, that's also equal to pi alpha or d alpha 2, we said if the price of beta turns out to be a quarter and you're getting two dividends, then by paying a quarter you get two dividends. So it means to get one apple, it only cost you an eighth. So effect an eighth of a dollar. So P2, we could figure out, 
So once we've got our financial equilibrium, it basically is determining a general equilibrium. So instead, so let's go backwards. Instead of solving for the financial equilibrium that looks complicated, let's solve for the general equilibrium. What is the effect of general equilibrium? It's the same utilities as before, but we've augmented the endowments according to, by looking through the veil of the stocks, we realize that A actually owns three apples in the future. One because he owns all of stock alpha, and another one because he owns half of stock beta. So we've got the simple economy that we're used to solving that you did on the first problem set, so we can do it again and solve it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now solve for general equilibrium. I have to solve for P1 and P2 and all the XA1, XA2, XB1, XB2. But I can fix one of the prices to be 1. So I'll fix P1 to be 1. Then what does A do? So I made a mistake, which is why you weren't following me. A has Cobb Douglas, 2 thirds of the weight is on good one and one third on good two. So he's going to spend two thirds of his money on the first good. So that's why this should have been a two thirds, as she pointed out. Thank you. So two thirds of his money. What's his money? His endowment is one three. So it's P1 times one, which is one times one, plus three times P2 divided by the price P1. Two thirds of the income divided by the price of the first good. That's how many of the first good he wants to eat. What does she want to do? She's going to spend, she's patient. She's going to spend half her income on both goods. So half of her income, which is 1 plus P2 times 1, divided by 1. That's how many apples today she wants. And that's what we have to clear to clear the apple market at time 1. So does this make sense now? I'm looking at you in the front. Do you, do you agree with this, or is this confusing now? You're, does this make? Okay, someone else? All right, so do you follow this or is this confusing? I can say it again if it's okay, confusing. Uh, yeah. Our denominator represents what they want to have in the future. Okay, remember how the uh, Cobb Douglas worked? This is, the, this is this trick I'm going to use over and over again. With log utilities, everybody will spend depending on the coefficients. So remember, this utility in the problem set, you know that this utility is just the same as if I put two thirds here and one third here, right? Because I'm just multiplying, I'm dividing this by three. So instead of one and a half, so the original utility is this, right? It's, uh, it's log x plus one half log x2. So the sum of these things is three, the sum of this plus this is three halves. I can multiply by two thirds. So if I multiply this by two thirds, I get two thirds here and one third here. Right? And I haven't changed the utility function. And now I know this is a familiar pattern. A is always going to spend two-thirds of his money on the first good. Okay? And B, I can multiply this whole utility by a half and a half, and B is going to spend, and now we recognize it as the common Cobb Douglas thing, and we could say that A is going to spend half his money on the first good and half his money on the second good. Okay, so what have I done? Fisher said. Look, this model is so complicated, you're thinking in your heads, people are deciding in period one, how much stock should I buy, how many bonds should I buy, how many apples should I eat? But really, if they're smart, they're not going to think that way. They're going to say to themselves, how many apples should I buy today, how many apples do I want to consume tomorrow? All these financial assets are just methods for me getting apples tomorrow in exchange for apples today. And what's the trade-off between the apples? Was this P1 and P2 is the trade-off between apples. You can look through the stocks and all that, but no matter which stock you think of buying, there's going to be the same trade-off between apples today and apples tomorrow because of, of the no arbitrage. You know, the price of alpha is going to have to be exactly half the price of beta. So if I, once I solve for this e economy and get the price of alpha, I'll know how many apples today I have to trade off in order to get apples tomorrow. So I might as well forget about all the stocks and just try to figure out what must that trade off between P1 and P2 be, okay? So that's why you can forget about the stocks, forget about the bonds. Everybody's thinking, I'm trading off apples today for apples next year. 
I'm making all the trades today because I'm trading apples today in exchange for promises for apples next period. So it's as if everything happens today. It's as if they're present value prices today. We trade today at prices P1 and P2 for apples today and apples next year. Of course, the apples won't appear till next year, but I can sell an apple today at price P1 and buy promises for apple next year at a price P2. And that's the trade-off I'm facing. If I face that trade-off, how much of my money am I going to spend on apples today? I'm going to spend two-thirds of my money on apples today. And the other third, I'll spend on promises for apples next period. OK, so I mean, this is a big insight Fisher had. It's not surprising. It's a little puzzling. I'm so used to it that I've forgotten how puzzling it is. So ask me some more questions. This was not an obvious thought Fisher had. Yeah. Okay, the price, often there'll be inflation. So Q2, the contemporaneous price next period might be higher than the contemporaneous price this period. But we don't care about that. What we care about is how many apples you have to give up today in order to get apples tomorrow. So that's called the present. So P2 is the present value price. What do you have to give up today to get the apple next period? So we expect P2 to be less than P1. Precisely because, well, we're going to come to that. That's the next thing I was going to talk about, because everybody's putting more weight on consumption today than they are on consumption in the future. That's why the price P1 is going to be bigger than the price P2. Yep? So when we're solving it, we're solving in real prices. So we're solving for P1 and P2 and present value prices. OK, so the crucial thing is he invented this term, present value prices. The prices you pay today no matter when you're going to get the stuff. That's his big insight. You should look at present value prices. Holding stocks and all that complicated stuff is just giving you goods in the future. So when you buy the stocks today, you should think, how much am I having to pay today to get an apple in the future? You can deduce that from the price of stocks and how many dividends they're paying. So everybody must have figured out a P2. What does it cost today? How much money do I have to give up today? to get a pr an apple in the future. Well, I have to buy a stock and then sell the dividends and all that. But really, what I should be thinking about is what's the price today I'm paying for one apple in the future? And that's P2. And so when you think about it that way, although it's an intertemporal problem, it looks like a new model with time, Fisher said you can reduce it as if they're, think of it as if they're just the same problem we did before. With two goods, you're trading at the same time. That's not an obvious thing to have thought of. No one thought of it before him. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So this should have been a Q2 here, because you, you sell the dividend, and you get money by selling the dividend. Thank you. Ho, ho, ho. Very good. Who, who said that? I have to, who, who just asked that question? Where are you? OK, I'll remember you. That was very good. Exactly. So in the future, you're getting the money for, so what he pointed out is I made another mistake here. The, the, when, in the future, the money you're spending on goods in the future you're going to get the dividends paid. Of course, you can sell the dividends for money, and the price is Q2. So a Q2 has to appear over here, just like there's a Q2 over there. So it's the goods times the price. That's the money you're getting in the future, and that's the money you're spending on the good X2. Very good. Too bad you didn't ask me that a while ago, but anyway. <laughs> OK, any other questions? OK, so we're back to this standard general equilibrium problem. We can take a financial equilibrium and turn it into a general equilibrium. And so when we solve this, we're going to have 2 thirds plus P2 plus 1 half plus 1 half P2 equals 2. So um, looks like 3 halves, hope I haven't done this wrong, P2 equals um, 2 minus 2 thirds plus 2p2. Thank you. Yeah, plus 2p2. OK, so we have 2p2 plus a half plus a half p2. So we have 5 halves p2. That was lucky. You caught that. 5 halves p2. And then over here, we have 2 minus, uh, so 2 thirds is 4 sixths and 3 sixths is 9 sixths and 12 sixths minus 9 sixths 
is uh, what is this? So what's two minus two thirds minus a half? Five sixths. That's correct. Okay, so P2 therefore equals one third. All right, so we've now solved for equilibrium. We know that P1 has got to be one. P2 has got to be one third. We know that um, we can figure out what consumption is going to be. I mean, x a1, for example, if we wanted to solve for that, we just plug in a third here. So we'd have two thirds times one plus three, which is two thirds times a four, which is eight thirds, I guess. Okay, and you know, x b1, we could have solved for that too if we wanted to. x b1 is going to be a half times four thirds, which is two thirds. That, that doesn't. Okay, a half plus what was this? One third. So no, it's one plus one third, which is four thirds, times a half, which is two thirds. Is that right? Well, that doesn't look right. So maybe I did this wrong. One plus one plus one is two. So this is four thirds. That looks better. Okay, four thirds. X A one is four thirds. X B one is two thirds. Okay, so we have four thirds and two thirds, and so we could solve similarly for X A two and X B two, which I won't bother to do. So we can figure out what the prices are, the present value prices, and the present value consumption. But having done that, Fisher says, okay, we took a hard problem, we made it easy. Let's go back to the hard problem. Can we? F okay, so Fisher says the trade-off between good one and good two is one to a third. So he defined, here's the nominal rate of interest. Fisher defined something called the real rate of interest. And he said that was a variable you should pay a lot of attention to. So the real rate of interest, he said, is um, P1 divided by P2. So this is equal to 3. And so R is 200%. Okay, so why did I get that? Just as someone in the front said, the good two is much less expensive. The present value of good two is much less than the present value of good one. People like, people think an apple today is much more valuable than an apple tomorrow. So if you give up an apple today, you can get three apples next year. Just like if you put, so if you put an apple in the bank, it's like getting 200% interest on apples. So he called that the real rate, the apple rate of interest. You put an apple in the bank, you know, you give up an apple today, buy stocks, and when it comes out in the end, you've got 200% more apples than you started with. So it's the real rate of interest. Okay, so that's his crucial variable. Now, let's go back to the original equilibrium. What is the stock price? Assume now that Q... Assume Q1 equals 1. Okay, what is the stock price, pi alpha? Okay, well, we can figure it out. How can we figure it out? What is pi alpha? Well, stock alpha pays one good tomorrow. So what is the price of pi alpha? What? Somebody said it. I couldn't hear it. A third. How did I get a third? Because we figured out that once everybody looks through the veil, assuming the price P1 is 1 and the price Q1 is 1, if they look through the veil, they're going to say to themselves, aha, how much do I have to pay today to get an apple in the future? I have to pay uh, a third to get one apple in the future. P1 is three times P2. So to get one apple in the future is only a third of an apple today. So the stock pays one apple in the future. So therefore, how much do I have to pay today? I have to pay one third of an apple today. And since I took the price of apples to be one, it's going to be the price of one third. So what's the price beta? Two thirds. Okay, so Fisher said, look, we've solved now for all these financial things. Okay, so all right, so what you can't do, Fisher's theory, Fisher's theory does not explain how much 
uh, how much of each stock. Stock, theta A, et cetera, uh, the investors hold. Why is that? Well, because it doesn't matter. Not enough is happening in the economy yet. Alpha and beta are exactly the same. If you own twice as much of the alpha tree, you get exactly the same as having the beta tree. So how can you possibly tell whether somebody's going to hold twice the alpha tree or just one beta tree? Either way, he's going to get the same thing. So the theory can't possibly explain which one they're going to do. Somehow they'll, they'll work it out and divide up the tree so that everybody ends up with the right number of apples in the end. And it also does not explain does not explain inflation. Okay, because you can't tell what Q2 is going to be. Right? Because you see in this budget set, thanks to that inspired question, if you double Q2, Q2 appears everywhere, you're not going to change the second equation. So Q2 could be anything. And it, uh, you're, you, know, you can double it or triple it. It won't matter. Okay, so Q, and the same with Q1. It's just like Valras said before. You can always normalize prices to be one. So, you, the, so the theory, you know, if you had a, he had to add another theory of money and how many dollars were floating around in the economy to explain Q2. This theory won't explain it. So it does not explain inflation. And it does not explain um, who holds which stock. And so it does not explain the nominal rate of interest does not explain I, the nominal rate of interest. Because $1, who knows what $1 is going to be worth? It depends on how much inflation we have. But it does explain the real rate of interest. It does explain R. And that's the variable that Fisher said is the one economists should always pay attention to, the real rate of interest. Okay, so that's the crucial variable. So if you want to figure out what's the price today of a stock, so Fisher's famous equation is the price of a stock today, okay, so pi alpha divided by Q1, so the real price, as somebody said, the price in terms of goods of the stock today is always going to equal the dividend in the future divided by 1 plus r. Okay, why is that? That's exactly what we already used. Okay, this is just a rewriting of the trick we did before. You take the stock tomorrow and you multiply it. So you, you just you take the dividend tomorrow, you multiply it by P2, okay, and then you realize that 1 plus R is just P1 divided by P2. So replacing the P1s and P2s by Q1 and 1 plus R, today's real stock price is just the dividends tomorrow discounted. This is what he called the fundamental theorem fundamental theorem of asset pricing. So if you knew the real rate of interest, you'd be able to figure out what all the stocks were worth just by, just like we did. You know, once we knew P1 and P2, the present value, the present value prices determine the interest rate because they're just, as we said, P1 over P2, remember, is 1 plus R. So knowing P1 and P2, you're always normalizing P1 to be 1. That's the same, P2 is the same as 1 over 1 plus R. So if you know P2 or you know 1 over 1 plus R, you know what the value of the stocks are. Okay, that's his critical insight. Now, just to finish, in thir yes? Q1. Q1, which is the same as P1, you know, because it's today's price in both. The contemporaneous price today is the present value of the price today. Okay? So... Let me just end on this one note. Fisher said, okay, we can take financial equilibrium without uncertainty, reduce it to general equilibrium. We know everything about general equilibrium. Therefore, we know everything about financial equilibrium. And we realize that the crucial variable in general equilibrium is relative prices. There is no just interest rate. The nominal interest rate, who the hell cares? The real interest rate is what we care about. And just, and just in normal economics, there's no just 
relative price, there's no just real interest rate. It depends on people's utilities. You make them more patient, and, the, you know, and that's going to affect the real interest rate. You make them less patient, it's going to affect the real interest rate. You give them more endowments today versus tomorrow, that's going to affect the real interest rate, the relative price between today and tomorrow. That's the way you should think about finance. That's the way you should explain what's going on in the financial markets. So in the problem set, you're just going to do a problem like that, and then I'm going to give more interpretations of this that Fisher gave. So I guess I'm out of time, so we'll stop here.